Welcome to the Twin Cities Real Estate Show, sponsored by Bricks Real Estate. I'm Kirk Duckwell. Joining me is Chad Vandalot and Brian Durham. And we are the House Geeks. If you have any questions for us, you can give us a call at 612-207-5388. Again, 612-207-5388. You can also check us out anytime online at housegeeks.com for the latest and greatest searching and researching tools. Check out our uh, home searching app as well. If you like to play around with your smartphone, search for homes. A lot of great data there. Um, also, you can watch us record live on Facebook most Wednesday, Wednesdays at noon. Just search House Geeks. Today, we're going to be talking about a subject that I'm really passionate about and I think is, is a great thing to be bringing to as many people as possible because I'm, I'm just amazed on the number, uh, more surprisingly, the number of agents that don't really understand how houses are built. And more so as well to the home buyers out there to be able to, you know, know what the pros and cons um, of Twin Cities homes and when they were built and what they were built out of uh, as you're out there shopping. Because each era has it, it, its positives and negatives. So this is going to be probably a multi, well, I know for sure, multi-episode series oh, yeah. of how houses are built in the Twin Cities. Really, let's just first start off with... Um, now, you, Kirk, you started out building and remodeling homes, too, so you're coming at this this episode with experience, correct? Uh, yes, yes, and I, I learned a lot uh, yes. <laughs> through, through uh, doing some things right and doing some things wrong and learning from my mistakes there. Um, and, you know, these are, these are things that when I'm out shopping, and I know that we talk about regularly um, when we're uh, out with clients, but, you know what are the, the things to keep an eye out for because you know it, it can vary so much not just from age when you're talking about quality but but who built it mm -hmm. you know who was the builder i mean just look at what's being built out there now there's crappy homes and there's really good homes mm -hmm. depending on who's putting it together and there's and, crappy and, new homes there's crappy old homes there's good old homes and good new homes so age has little factor in whether it's good or bad. Well, not only age, but price point. I mean, some of these new construction, I've been in some stuff lately that's starting in the upper 380s, mm -hmm. and you walk through it, and the fits and finish are not what you would expect. Then you I, walk into some other builders that are building same price point, some smaller family builders that we really like, and, and for the same price, they can build you a house that just, to me, is a much better fit, finish, and... and well, yeah, honestly, a lot of the national builders out there, I just don't think, put the time and effort into shopping for quality materials. It's just slap it up and, mm -hmm. and, and build it. Mm -hmm. um, you got to realize, you know, and that's kind of the way it's, it's been as long as, for the, for the most part, uh, in the Twin Cities, as long as houses have been being built, the ones that were just thrown up quickly by builders that are just trying to knock out as many as possible, those are the ones you got to be a little careful of. You want you, the ones that have the the more custom builder that's involved, um, where they, they, they care more, um, tend to be the, the, the better homes. And we see just drastic variations from uh, age to age, as, as I know we're out there looking at homes. I, I, I look at about 400 homes a year, and it just amazes me on the, the, the variations that you see. Um, so starting from the ground, okay, so when, when, when a home is first going to be built, you got to find a lot, right? So, you know, for people out there looking and you're thinking new construction, hey, the lot that you're looking to build on, you need to put a lot of thought into that um, because things to consider are what are the soil conditions of that lot? Is there something that am I going to need to worry about settling in that home? And if you think settling still doesn't happen, I can take you over mm -hmm. to a nice little development in Woodbury that went in a few years ago where, you know, they didn't do a very good job of testing the soil yeah. conditions. They thought, hey, let's build these communities around all these cute little ponds, and before you know it, their slabs are cracking everywhere, yep. you know, mm -hmm. and you, you got to be careful. You, you have... Um, well, and also when it goes into your lot, you want to look at the topography of the lot, too. I mean, is it, is it super flat? Are you wanting to do, you know, if you want to walk out Rambler, you're going to need some sort of hill or somewhere to put that house. And if it's not there, they're going to have to build it, which is going to increase your cost. Yeah, mo moving dirt is not exactly cheap. And there's another downfall to moving dirt. 
the soil that you have there is compacted. It's been that way for a very, very long time, you know, unless it's been developed before recently. And generally uh, speaking, there's three types of soil. You have your sand, your loam, and your clay. They have different properties. Sand will have the best drainage property, but it doesn't provide a very strong foundation to lay concrete on. Um, loam is a combination of clay and sand where it has average drainage properties and it will provide a pretty firm foundation. Clay, on the other hand, is the absolute hardest, most compact, but it does not allow water to drain away very well from the house. Yeah, so take, taking all those factors into consideration, figuring out, you know, where is the water going to go? Look at what's around you, especially if you're buying in a development, you know, and you look at the houses next door <laughs> and you, you look at where, where the uh, wetlands are. I mean, there's always got to be a place for this water to go. And if you're seeing a hill coming right at your house, you know, there's something to consider. And, you know, people automatically just go to, oh, well, you know, we can just have drain tile in there. Well, what if power goes out? You know, you need power, oh, battery backup. Well, what if the battery's dead? Or, you know, there, there's all these things to take into consideration. Granted, you have the battery alarms, and there's lots of precautions that you can take. But if you just, when in the shopping process, instead of trying to put a Band-Aid mm -hmm. on something, you put a little thought into that lot and make sure that, hey, long term, the grade is going to work for me. And keep in mind, too, that once you put in that foundation, the home is still going to move a little bit. And mm -hmm. even if the house doesn't necessarily move uh, too much, that, that when you have the water coming off the roof or you have the gutters draining, that that soil is going to shift. And that's why you'll see people, oh, we've, we haven't had problems in, in 20 years in our house and we had problems this year. Well, did you ever regrade? Oh, no, we didn't think we needed to. And you'll see, you'll walk up to their house and you mm -hmm. see, we've all seen it, and I'm sure everybody's seen it. You walk around somebody's house and you, you see that little rut going all the way around the house, and it's just a, a prime point for that water to start to come in. Well, that's when I see too. water in the basement, that's the first thing I do is walk around the outside of the house and go directly to the spot where it's entering. And most, more often than not, it's a depression that puts water into that one specific location, and there's no gutters up on the outside of the home in that location, or the down, uh, the, uh, the downspout which directs it away from the house is off so you have a bunch of water being dumped into one little spot. I had a great one last year. It was a by it was in Roseville by a lake and we're looking at it and it kind of went uphill a little bit towards the lake and then the uh, sump pump was like discharging only about halfway so you'd watch it go up the hill and you could see it running right back down the yeah. foundation. <laughs> I was at one on Monday night where uh, it was over by Nokomis, and the, you could tell that the neighbor next door had had some serious water issues because the roof was bad on their house, but it had brand new concrete poured slabs sure. all the way around. Yep. And where they had set it up was now all that water was running right into the house next door, right at it. And we, that's the one we were looking at. And there was there was nothing you could do without tearing out trees and doing some serious uh, re remanufacturing of the lot. You know, so these are things to think about, too, not just when it comes to new construction, but anytime. I mean, you want to check out that lot and look for those water issues. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, if the house was built with a good grade and intentions to keep it dry, that can change over time. You know, really kind of the next thing to consider once you have, you know, you know about your soil conditions, whether it's the house that you're buying or a house that you're building, is, is knowing your foundation and what to expect out of that foundation. So really, the first foundations were, you know, fields, rock. Stacked stone foundations. Yeah, stack. You see them just down the street here, and there's a lot of them in St. Paul. Yep, mm -hmm. stacked stone foundations. A lot of these were built as crawl spaces or, you know, partial foundations, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way they were built. It wasn't meant to be a dry basement. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just what's holding up the house. Now, many of these homes, it's, you know, what, four and a half, five feet? Oh, that, you're that, lucky. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I was actually in one in, in Bloomington that um, yeah, it's three and a half feet, maybe. They had, it looked like it was hand shoveled out yeah. to put the furnace down there. Yep. Um, so, you know, you, you have the, 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 the field stone foundations where it's all stacked up. And then, 
we kind of shifted to the river rock or limestone foundations. Now, before you move on, is there any field stone foundations with crawl spaces that you can expect to be dry? I wouldn't expect it. I would, I would just, if you're looking at that, and it, granted, this, I mean, stones are porous, you know, yeah, for yeah. the most, I mean, it, it's gonna, it's gonna get water, but more importantly, the, the mortar that they used is just gonna allow water through. I mean, if, if you're down in one of these basements and you just take your finger and run it around the, the rock, you'll, it'll just come right off. Yeah, I mean, like you said, those, those foundations were built to hold the house, not built to have finished basements and fancy areas. It, they're gonna get wet. Exactly. Yep, it, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna come up to a commercial break here. One, one type of foundation, I haven't seen it a whole lot, but you do run into them, is actually brick, real brick foundations. Have you seen those? Like, you know, fire, you know, clay, yeah, clay brick. a little bit in Richfield. Yeah, I, I've run into a couple of them. Um, well, I think the, the main problem is they, they're just not thick enough. Uh, everyone that I've seen, I've always had like bowing trouble yeah. with them. There's just, just not enough to, to retain the, the movement. And that's, that's one of the bigger problems here in the Twin Cities is that, you know, not, not only do we have to deal with the water, but we have to deal with the water when it freezes. And when that yeah. water freezes, it's going to push on that foundation. Well, it's and, like 30,000 PSI frost heave or something like yeah. that, 36,000. I mean, it's just, it's insane how, how much that frost heaving can move the ground. Yeah, so, you know, you do see some of those. When we get back, we'll talk a little bit more about foundations. If you have any questions for us, you can give us a call at 612-207-5388. Again, 612-207-5388. Check us out online at housegeeks.com. We'll be right back. Ready? Mm -hmm. Clicking right back up at foundations. Moving into block and 1940s and 50s homes. Well, I'll, I, I want to talk about those, those, those poured blocks, you know, the long ones that mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. Welcome back to the Twin Cities Real Estate Show with the House Geek, sponsored by Bricks Real Estate. Check us out online at housegeeks.com for the latest and greatest searching and researching tools. Also, check out our home searching app for your smartphone. All right, today we are talking about how houses are built in the Twin Cities, kind of going from ground all the way up to the roof, the different ages, what things are built out of, made out of, the pros and cons to each of those, what to expect from them. This is going to be a multi episode series. If you have any suggestions, I know we're going to probably miss some things as we're going through, you know, feel free to send us an email with uh, any thoughts or, or points we may have missed on this, but we really kind of want to take you through why houses are built the way they were at the time they were built and, and uh, what to kind of keep an eye out for and, and what to know when you're going through these homes. So we were talking about um, foundations and we left off at brick foundations, like clay brick foundations. Really didn't see a whole lot of those. I'm only coming to it a couple of times. Really kind of, you know, you had, and that, from the time of the um, the river rock, limestone, mm -hmm. it was right around, I'd say about 1915. So, you know, at first you had your field stone foundations that went, uh, or river rock foundation, whatever you want to call it, that went from about, you know, your 1860s up into the uh, late 1800s, and then it kind of shifted, and you got into the limestones, and that kind of held up until about 1910, 1915, and you start to see that shift. And I've seen earlier, I know I have, but you see that shift into the those poured concrete blocks. They look like giant concrete bricks. I'm not talking about the same block that you see now. Yeah, but not cinder block. Not cinder block. These yeah. are just big concrete blocks. Solid like Lego looking blocks. Yes, almost. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and those were used, oh geez, up until probably about the 1930s. 30s, yeah, I was yeah. Say late 30s. And 
you know i've definitely seen you were talking about the amount of force that's put on these foundations it was a thirty one thousand p s i or something like that across the summer it's somewhere in the thirty thousand yeah and so i've seen especially in those areas where the soils get very wet man those things will just start shifting and moving i think i got a post up uh on our facebook page from last summer of a of a foundation that had some pretty serious movement in it mm -hmm. um and and honestly i know from you can repair these issues um i always heard um and i don't know if you guys like if you see more than three inches of deviation where the wall's leaning in like oh no you better run away yeah, um that's... or or if the, the crack you can put a credit card into or mm -hmm. you know all these different things to watch out for as you're going through through the houses and and it, it it's honestly those foundations not so much the limestone but it's the, the those block and then the new cinder block where i've seen the most movement issues um that i've run across while showing homes um you know if if you have a block foundation um that Really, if it's core filled, that's the best. Yeah. Where they run the rebar. Weight. Yep. They run the rebar through there to hold it steady, and then they they core fill it with concrete. Um, and that's, I mean, I question which is better, a poured foundation or a block foundation. And I hear people, contractors argue mm -hmm. about the the pros and cons to each. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you got core filled rebar, it's probably pretty similar to a poured with rebar foundation. Um, you know, these days, one of the biggest differences that you're seeing in foundations is they will put um, on the outside potentially some insulation or a vapor barrier mm -hmm. so that uh, potential water intrusion can't even happen. You know, from it, it's going to hit that rubber membrane or the paint that they put on there, the rubber paint, mm -hmm. um, or sometimes even the insulation that they're using has that, that barrier on it. Um, I know, uh, I, I personally think insulating from the outside is the smart way to go. Why even let the block get cold or why even let the block get wet? Um, you know, they, one of the other differences that you see with foundations is as time has gone on, they get deeper and deeper and deeper for the most part. And that's to, you know, make more of a stable foundation. You go back to the houses built in the 1800s and early uh, 1900s that that those are the ones that have the biggest settling issues you don't mm -hmm. see as much of that it's not that houses still don't settle a little bit but you definitely don't see as much of that now as you once did um you know once the foundation is put in um i think it was starting right around the late uh, 70s mid 70s is when you really started to see drain tile kind of come around as um, a solution to water intrusion. Mm -hmm. the, the, the funny thing is with, with drain tile is I think it's like the, the end all solution. Oh yeah, just put drain tile in, just put drain tile in. I, I hear that answer from contractors all the time. When kind of going back to our first segment where we we're talking about soil conditions and grading and, and fill and all of that stuff that, you know, if you have a good grade away from the home, you know, um, what is it? Uh, six inches of rise over the course of three feet out away from the house. You'll get a nice slope to get the water put away. Um, make sure you have gutters and you have those extensions on there pushing that water away. It's amazing how often that's going to be the solution before you have to go spend five, seven thousand dollars on a drain yeah, tile I've, system. I've been in plenty of houses where they have drain tiles installed and they still have water issues. Well, it's a band-aid because they think about it. The water comes in from up top most of the time, right? So unless you're buying a wetland or something like that. So water comes in from up top and it's making its way towards the house. Well, it's going to hit that wall probably before the very bottom where the drain tile system is. Yeah, exactly. and there's nowhere for it to go. Yeah, unless, unless somebody's put in a membrane on the outside or, I mean, I've seen people do it on the inside too. You see that in a lot of the older homes. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, you're allowing your block to get wet. And that's what you don't want, because if your block gets wet and it freezes, I mean, how many homes have we walked around that foundation and you see the splintered block everywhere and they, they keep patching it? Well, that's just a cosmetic fix 
not really fixing the problem Issue, keeps yep. the block from getting wet. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a good gutter system, good grading, um, you know, putting something, you know, maybe actually digging down before you set the grade and putting on some of that uh, uh, coating that you can get to keep from the block actually having uh, the water penetration into it. Well, it's the same. Sometimes you have to look at the, the yard itself where uh, we've had to install French drains or different drainage tiles up there, especially well, if you're at the bottom. Before the next the break, was a, so a French drain, what what is that? Because I know that, the, you know. Typically, it's a, it's a hole that's drilled down, um, usually three to four feet. They, you backfill it with rock. And then you can, they can be connected, they can just be individual right. they put, drains. Well, drain tile is a, so, a tube yeah. that is inserted into that hole with, yeah. with uh, holes in it to allow water in. So what it, yeah, what it does is it lets the water, it gives the water somewhere to go down instead of sitting or when the top couple inches get soaked and the water's running back towards the house. It gives it somewhere to get down and into the ground. And honestly, a French drain system, if you are all handy or feel like doing a weekend project, it's not that hard to put in. As you long know. as your soil is easy to do. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah don't don't, don't try to do it in August, maybe. <laughs> yeah, especially if you have clay soil in your yard where it's a rock in August. You want to do those in spring. It makes it a little easier on yourself. Or just go, go to your local store and rent a drill. You know. All right, we're going to take a quick com commercial break. We'll be right back. Check us out on housegeeks.com. Talking. Yeah, so I do want to do one quick correction. Uh, I, I need cipher frost is about ten thousand psi, not thirty thousand or twenty thousand. Okay. I just want to correct that before we when we first come back in. Welcome back to the Twin Cities Real Estate Show with the House Geeks. Check us out online at housegeeks.com for the latest and greatest home searching and researching tools. Check out our smartphone app as well. If you have any questions for us, you can give us a call at 612-207-5388. Again, 612-207-5388. Uh, if you are thinking about buying or selling a home or just have any questions, you can always reach out to us either through giving us a call or online at the House Geeks uh, Facebook page. Or if you're watching us live, uh, on on Facebook, you can type us your questions. Happy to help answer those. Send us a message. Today we are talking about how houses are built in the Twin Cities from going back to the 1860s up until now, starting with uh, the grade and the lot all the way to the roof. Um, we know it's going to take us a few episodes to go through all of this. We've discussed grading, foundation, uh, drain drainage, um, Let's get into uh, the joists and support systems that are used. However, Brian, you did mention something uh, you wanted to, to yeah, uh, one, change. Yeah, one quick correction that I wanted to mention. Uh, I looked it up during the break, and PSI for frost is about 10,000 PSI. Either but way, it's still a lot. That's a lot. It's, yeah. it, it, that figures out to about 720 tons per square foot. So wow. that's a lot of pressure. Yes, yep. And so, you know, having, having that good foundation... And the um, drainage, get that water away, is so important. Right, because you start to let those pockets build up, you know, because when you when that, that expands, you can get these voids by the foundation, and water just wants to go there, sit there, especially, like, if you have a clay um, uh, soil, where it can just, you know, 
go right up next to the house and you can, you can have serious issues. So making sure the uh, grading is correct, the drainage is correct is so important. Um, okay, so kind of going back with, you know, we talk about the, the limestone or uh, rock foundations that, you know, the main, right down the center of the home, the main support at that time, they would use just big timbers, right? And you'll go down into a lot of these homes, and what do you see? You see two or three other metal ones mm -hmm. people have added, and they've cranked them up. And well, the reason being is the timbers over time would start to bow. Okay, so it's very, very common. You walk into a house that was built basically from uh, about you know the 1860s, 1880s, all the way up to the 19. 30s, 40s time frame, you'll have what I call center settling. The house settles towards the center of the home. However, like once you get by the chimney, it might scoot back up real mm -hmm. quick. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, right, yeah. right. So that's very, very normal for a home of this age. And so what did a lot of people do? They started to notice that and they put in these little supports. At the end of the day, the best that you can do is just support what you have already going on and don't try to necessarily correct it and bring it back because what can happen is you can then start to place weight on other parts of the foundation and you can cause additional damage to the property and this what happened has taken place over the course of a hundred years you know and to sit there and try to jack that back up or you know I see a lot of people well you can pour level like leveling compound well you can do that but that's a lot of weight too I mean, especially if you're talking about an inch or two of deviation from one room to the next, you know, you're pouring a fair amount of weight on there, and that, that may cause even more issues to happen. Honestly, one of the, the better solutions I've seen to fixing that is um, that you almost sister in. You rip up the floor, you put down new um, uh, decking, flooring, and then you put the, yeah, the flooring over the top of that. To, to level everything out, but it's not a small project because then you have to move all the trim, and and you're still going to notice it as you're walking through doorways. You're going to see, see the mm -hmm. slant in, in those uh, wells. Um, so I mean, center settling very normal. What's not normal, and what you got to be a little more worried about, is if you see significant like sideways, you know, where it's leaning to one side of the home. It's actually one I looked at in uh, South Minneapolis one time with a client. Um, I wish I still had the picture. I mean, this thing was serious, yeah. seriously leaning. Oh, man, I, I would have to give it at least a foot or two. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I don't know if that's that's too much to yeah, uh, that. But it, excessive, but it was a good six or eight inches. I remember seeing the picture. It was huge. Yeah, you, lo you, you look at the thing and you're seeing it. Tip. It was like a fun house. And, you know, honestly, um, with when you get really bad settling, especially if you start combining center settling with side settling and all the stuff going on, I don't know about you guys, but I've walked through these houses and you walk out dizzy yeah. or you're like spatially disoriented. Um, but yeah, you got to watch out. You know, if you really have a lot of lean going on, are, are you dealing with movement that is still happening? Eventually, though, this got um, slowly resolved. You started seeing, you know, actually using, you know, to take the lumber, turn it like an I-beam almost, and, and put in, um, you know, maybe take a couple, what is it, uh, two by 12s, take a couple two by 12s, and then they'd run that mm -hmm. down the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And and so you didn't see quite as much, but it was, the, the problem was really fixed in the, the mid-40s, and you noticed it definitely by the time you got into to 1950 is almost every house of that era has a metal I-beam running right down the center. This stopped your center, center settling. Mm -hmm. Okay, Does that not mean the home's still not going to settle? No, it, you may still get movement. So you might have one corner where you have a big hideous crack and on both sides in, in the basement and it's, it's moving. Um, and so that's something to, to, to keep in mind as you're looking uh, around because it, it can still be an issue. You're just not going to feel it as much as you're walking through the houses. Um, and now they have the, um, you don't um, always see that that center beam anymore. No. Recently, now it's, now it's these engineered joists. Mm -hmm. Think of it like a, a modern truss, 
you know, where, where they have the metal brackets that hold everything together, except for it's for the floor joist. The nice thing about that is you can run... Oh, you get huge spans. Well, you can run huge spans. Yeah. Um, I mean, 25 feet plus. I mean, mm-hmm. you, and now you can have these big open layouts. And that's you know, part of the reason that your homes that were built, uh, you know, the 30s and 40s and 50s didn't have these huge sprawl, sprawling layouts for the most part. It's because they needed to have load-bearing walls. And you'd have to have, you know, one or two, or depending on how big the space is, running through that, and, and so it chopped it up. But in the modern homes, with the engineered uh, joists, they can run it all the way across that house. Um, and it allows for you to run all the mechanicals through it. So you don't need to have the duct work that is boxed in down below. Um, you don't need to have... Um, you know, exterior conduit or whatever it may be, everything can be run through that that roof system or the, the joist system. Um, yeah, I mean, I still see some builders using just uh, the two by twelves. It kind of surprises me though now that they have the the engineered joists. I think it's just the far superior way to go in, in home construction. Um, so from, from joists, uh, from the supports, you get into framing, the framing of a house. Um, and this really varies um, depending on the age of the home of what materials were used. Chad, you had, I believe it was you, that house was it like framed with one buys or mm-hmm. something? Over and below. And, and like, yeah. like I asked you, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. There's no way. And then you like had somebody inspect it. Yeah, and we went around to every window and door and measured measured the gaps. And there, the only way, the only lumber that would fit in there would was be one, one, one by inch. one by one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, wow. Isn't that crazy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you know, you can have a cardboard box built. It's it's possible. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that if you go to the, the lumber yard and you buy a 2x4, it's not actually 2x4. It's not one, anymore. No, not anymore. Yeah. Um, it is 1.5 by 3.5. And, and that's because the size that it's cut at is actually, it is cut at a 2x4 rough. Really plain it. Yeah. Plain, and then it dries. Yep. And they know roughly how much that, that's going to shrink down. So you can actually, you know, if you want 2x4s or 2x6 construction, it's the houses that were built, I think it's like 360 or so, something along those lines, where you actually have stronger um, or, or thicker lumber. I shouldn't say stronger because, I mean, this all depends on the other materials that are being utilized as well in the process. Um, but, you know, that is something to consider, especially, you know, if you're looking at potentially re- buying a property and renovating it, what are those walls built mm-hmm. out of? Is it is it true two by four walls or is it really um, or two by six walls? Because you got to know what load can we put on that. You hear about oh I'm going to rip the roof off and put a second story on. Well, can your walls withstand that? Um, and and having a good engineer come out taking a look and and getting a good idea of uh, the, the the flexibility of the property I think is really important. But yeah, if you want a, a home that, I mean, some of, in my opinion, some of the most solid homes built um, are those those 19, late 1940s, 1950s, early 1960s houses. And um, up until very recently, uh, the reason being is they were built out of, you know, the real 2x4s and 2x6s. Mm-hmm. They were, a lot of them, sheathed, which sheathing is the... Uh, what they put on the outside of the wall before they put on the siding. And so a lot of those were actually pine plank sheathing. Mm-hmm. So um, you have you know some of the strongest material. And then on the inside, especially the, the um, uh, 50s houses, you have uh, plaster walls. Mm-hmm. So you got plaster, thicker lumber, uh, a lot of those... The I'm metal I beam running down, down the them center, center of the house. Yep. And I've even seen in a lot of those houses in the uh, 50s, early 60s, where they put a cinder, walk, uh, cinder block wall 
up to the I beam yep. to support the metal I beam as well with a lot with a run of cinder blocks. Yeah, these things are tanks. Maybe not necessarily. <laughs> and it's always... only holding up one floor. It's not <laughs> holding up two floors. One floor. Yeah, a lot. These things are, are built like tanks. Maybe not always the prettiest from the outside, but your first ring suburb homes. I mean, those mm -hmm. things are very, very solid. This is also the homes where you start to see going away from boiler heat and into forest air. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that here in a few minutes. Um, the, but yeah, kind of going back um, to the to the sheathing is you had you know solid wood plank, and that, and that I think kind of went. Oh, I'm sure somebody's going to comment on this. I think I think the solid board plank went till about the late 50s, and you started to see plywood for sheathing. Um, and plywood's also a very good sheathing product um, that can be utilized as well. Um, the, the, the pro is you don't necessarily get as much cracking. I mean, yeah. we've we've all gone up into the attics of of these homes and looked, and you, you, you'll see the splits and the knots and the breakouts of that pine planking. And so when they went to uh, went to the the uh, plywood, that solved a lot of that problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a little more economical too, I think. Well, yeah, you can cover a four by eight space instead of you know foot by yeah. five, eight feet or whatever it may be. All right, we're going to take a uh, short commercial break. When we get back, we'll discuss sheathing some more, as I know it. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, one of my favorite parts, because sheathing, I think, uh, was one of the biggest downfalls in construction at a certain point with certain uh, types and ages of homes. Mm -hmm. But we'll get back into that in just a minute. Wow, my stomach's growling. I need some food. I need like a bag of chips. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I'm sure everybody would love to listen to that. A little burping from the carbonated water, that's always good. All right. Bad asbestos is such a pain to remove. <laughs> that stuff will outlast us all. Everyone, that is <laughs> the absolute most durable but ugly siding on the face of the planet. Well, no, the new concrete. I, I can say yeah. that. I, I like the asbestos, con the asbestos uh, stuff tiles. Cracks, though. Oh, are you talking about the flooring? No, no, the stuff on the outside. It lasts forever. It does, but it breaks if you yeah. hit it with a Well, yeah, if you're smacking it with a baseball mm -hmm. or something. But yeah. if, I, a if a house can't take a good baseball hit, what's come on? <laughs> I just like the looks of it. I think it looks neat. Yeah, it's the shape kind of, yeah. Too bad. yeah. You guys ready? Looks a lot like cedar. you got to get close to it. Last segment. Here we go. All right. You always got to whisper, no, we're still good, though. It gave us a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Welcome back to the Twin Cities Real Estate Show. We're talking about how houses are built in the Twin Cities from the ground on up. If you have any questions, comments for us, you know, we submit them through our uh, website, housegeeks.com. Click on the contact page or go to our Facebook page. You can post comments as well underneath the shows. And, uh, yeah, check us out on Facebook. Type in uh, the Facebook, uh, or type in House Geeks into Facebook, and we have on there, you can download our apps, you can go to our website, all sorts of stuff, all our show records and whatnot. All right, so talking about how houses are built, getting into uh, sheathing, we are talking about the, the pine plank and into plywood sheathing, wanted to kind of get into, you know, and the, like I said, I think some of the strongest houses built were that that late 40s to mm -hmm. to 50s timeline just because you had you know um the, the pine plank uh sheathing you had the, the thicker lumber you had the um plaster walls i mean these things were tanks mm -hmm. um does that necessarily mean i think they're the best houses out there no not at all but as far as strength uh they they're they're very good um all right what you started to see when you got into the late 60s, uh, mid-60s, is a lot of trying to save money 
on materials and building costs. And not all builders did this. There were some very well-built homes um, during that time frame. But you did see a lot of people wanting to keep the costs way down. So this is when you saw kind of the introduction of the two-level split where, hey, we didn't have to go down into the ground as far. Does that mean that's a, that's a cheap house? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying they're trying to save costs there. The idea being is, hey, we're going to have more above lighted space, more usable space, not just some dark basement. Um, you know, pr and also... Oh, you were also able to get more square footage on a smaller lot, too. That was another thing that was a big yep. advantage with those. You know, one thing, uh, when uh, talking about the foundations, foundations, depths, and uh, we kind of bypassed it. We were talking about the um, uh, basements and drain tile and all that. You know, and what basements were meant to be wet. Well, with those 50s homes, they hadn't quite figured out how to perfectly mm -hmm. or best to mitigate water yet. And so they built these things to be able to get wet. And they knew that that was a possibility. And so that's why you'll see the tile floors and you'll see the wood paneling. Because sheetrock, if it gets wet for very long, you're going to have mold, yep. right? But wood, most of the time, is just going to rot. Yes, if you have significant water exposure, you'll start to get mold growth on it. But it was a lot easier material to deal with. You can rip it down and put new up. Or, or you dry it out. And, and no big deal, or mop it up, whatever it may be. Um, so one of you know, you go to the split levels, and you didn't have to go down into the ground as far. You kind of started to resolve some of those water issues as well, because you don't go down as deep. Likelihood of the water getting in, not as much. But where where I saw, you know, where we see some of the biggest issues is is kind of starting with that that siding and with that sheathing. And this is where you started to see the composite materials start to come in to play is, you know, you had your buffalo board, which is basically, I mean, it's it's a glorified pressed yeah. cardboard, yeah. you know. It, it, uh, the, the idea was insulation factor. That's why they did it, but it also was cost. This stuff was relatively thick, but it, uh, it provided an insulation factor, but they didn't consider, hey, it's going to get wet. <laughs> and what do we do if it gets wet, you know? And you'll see the that it will start to expand. And what, well, what, what did they not only put on top for siding of that buffalo board? They put composite siding. Yep. And mm -hmm. if you type in, you know, composite siding, 1970s, 1980s, or, or type in buffalo board and just go to Google Images, you'll see exactly what the I'm. The giant bubbles. And the oh, the bubbles, the yeah. delamination, the paint coming off, everything. I mean, there, and there was there was lawsuits galore with some of these materials because it was done, yes, with some like uh, energy savings costs in mind, but. The, the the main thing was the, the builder cost was down. Mm -hmm. And and so you ran into to lots of issues with that. And they used that Buffalo Born product I think it's in the late eighties, nineties. I say early I still see it in some mm -hmm. of the early nineties stuff. Yeah. Took them a while to figure out not to put the buffalo board all the way down to the <laughs> soil level too, where it wicks up the moisture from from the ground up. Now what you see today mostly is OSB or wafer board mm -hmm. sheathing, okay? This still can be prone to water uh, damage if exposed. However, as you approach the late 90s, you start to see house wrap, mm -hmm. okay? Tyvek, whatever you want to call it, that they put to protect that from getting damp. Um, and many reasons for doing that. One was to keep it from getting damp. Um, it was also done for energy efficiency. What, what's kind of interesting um, about house wrap is that if you go back to the 1950s houses, a lot of those were house wrapped, but they house wrapped it. Yeah, in the, in the what is the that, pa paper? Uh, it's like a... Well, yeah, it's the, the asphalt paper. Yeah. I can't think of that. I can't think of my head. The uh, brand but, name, but yeah. Yeah. That they they would wrap those houses to keep the to keep the uh, wood from getting wet and uh, tar paper that's the name I'm trying to think of 
yes they try to keep to keep the house from getting wet also to keep because the the wood would shrink you are going to get those little gaps in there so once again trying to make a little barrier but you know as soon as they started going to the composite materials they stepped completely away from that and that was kind of to their own downfall i mean honestly if you probably would have uh like you say, bring it up a little higher off the ground and put and the wrapped and wrapped it. The buffalo board probably would have been mm -hmm. fine, but um, now now you see homes that are are house wrapped. You get into some of these developments, though. Um, I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we can get into this and in uh, get farther into this in another episode. Is you run into these homes that were built in the '90s that were uh, stucco that they put on there oh. and, and what they did is they, they created a house that was almost so tight that that it couldn't like it could, it did, breathe. It could not the, yeah, right water to go right so stucco if you take if you take a glass of water and pour it like run it slowly down the stucco and you go to the bottom most like you're not going to get any water yep. it sucks it all up right and then the the wafer board would collect that water and because the house couldn't breathe you get mold, and so there are these multi, multi million dollar lawsuits, uh, all with builders all throughout the Twin Cities, about um, about that problem. And so then that's when funny you... side note on that is a lot of those builders now own mold remediation companies <laughs> to fix the problems. You know, in the new builds, they started, they figured out a lot of the ways to get around these problems, and it keeps getting better and better. Um, next week, we'll get into siding, uh, all the different types of siding that you see from, from brick to stucco to asbestos, aluminum. We'll talk about the pros and cons to those. Um, if you have any questions for us, something that we talked uh, didn't talk about today, up to siding. We're going to kind of go from there. So <laughs> to shoot us your suggestions. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, you can give us a call at 612-207-5388. Again, 612-207-5388. 388. Check us out online at housegeeks.com. We'll be back next week.